Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. My guest is one of the entertainment industry's newest breakout stars of stage, screen, and television. He is in New York, right here at the Park Avenue Armory, starring in director Robert Icke's critically acclaimed production of Hamlet through August 13th. Please say hello to Alex Lothar. Well, first of all, I am thrilled to be sitting with you, Alex, here in the gorgeous Armory, and I think we're in the Tiffany Room here. Well, first of all, welcome back to New York. How excited are you to be playing Hamlet here? Yeah, it's been um, two years that we've been waiting to uh, make it here because of coronavirus. Um, and so, yeah, it feels thrilling to finally to be here and in this extraordinary place. Yeah. So when did you arrive in New York? That's a good question. Yeah. My brain. I think it's been three weeks that we've been here. Um, and we have done a full week of previews as of last week. Yeah, so we've been here for two, three weeks, yeah. It must be like just surreal for you because you get here, then you start rehearsals of this beast of a show, mm -hmm. and then you like, you know, try to find some downtime. Um, I've spoken to many people over the years who have played the role of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. How much of a beast is this role, and what have the challenges been for you so far? It's been interesting rehearsing a show in one country and then performing it in another. There's something about um, another actor said this to me that it's a very particular thing building a home for a piece in one space and then getting on a plane and uh, performing it in another and I imagine uh, as with um, any country you move to with a play if you go on tour the play is always received slightly differently um, so the, our first previews were so thrilling um, because in um, uh, an English-speaking audience, but an American one predominantly, I imagine. Um, and so there's something exciting about that. They're very vocal. I, I love New York audiences. I mean, they, they yeah. you know, they'll like talk back or just like make a lot of sounds and everything else and really get onto the piece. Yes. Yes, I, uh, it, it, it is very different from a maybe a London UK audience in that sense. Um, people are up on their feet and yeah, <laughs> it's a real ride, yeah. So what have the challenges been for you so far? Because it's a big role. I suppose one of the joys of these two plays is that, uh, I say two plays because there's Hamlet, but we're eventually going to be running in rep with uh, the Oresteia. Um, and a challenge, yes, but also a kind of extraordinary event-like feeling to the two pieces. The fact that we had a certain amount of time to rehearse these two epic plays. I suppose, they, yeah, they are epic. I mean, particularly the Oresteia, this big Greek tragedy, but Shakespeare's The Hamlet, uh, The Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, um, also uh, um, a sort of, yeah, colossal in its size in its own right. Um, but something about doing the two plays together. The plays speak to each other. Um, they echo each other in really strange, surprising ways. So although it felt like quite a daunting task, I remember watching the last run through we did back in London of Oris Dyer, and I was so moved by it, not only because Rob's adaptation, our director, and he, 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 he had adapted the um, uh, Oris Dyer for this production, um, not only because <laughs> it is brilliant, um, but also because of the reflections it has in it to Hamlet. Um, whether unconscious or conscious, I'm not quite sure. But as a performer in one of the shows, it was sort of amazing being part of a company that's doing both for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about your director. He's one of the most sought after directors. What makes him such a great director to work with? I, it's hard to say with Rob, um, Rob Robert Ike. Um, he's, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is his intelligence, um, which he he has in in mountains full. But he also has um, a brilliant sense of humour. His intelligence is always about finding a way to make the play interesting and moving and all of his choices are about well, how do we make this uh, more moving and 
um, uh, more exciting to watch. Um, I, one of his mottos was sort of, I think he, watch, he watches rehearsals thinking of himself as, you know, <laughs> a teenager and thinking, well, would I be interested in this and would th does this hold my attention? And that he said to us at the beginning of rehearsals that, uh, at least in the UK, there's sometimes a tradition of, with these huge texts and these huge pieces, a sense of um, going to the theatre as a sort of obligation or something that has to be educational or, you know, sort of worthy, um, like eating your vegetables, you know. But actually, these pieces, when they're treated as um, uh, these big questions about what it is to be a human being, um, uh, sure, they have... Um, they, they, they bring the weight of their own history with them inevitably, but they are moving and funny and um, and strange and um, uh, uh, and and that's what Rob is seeking for. I think. I mean, he. I don't want to speak for him, um, but yeah, I suppose it's a mixture of that. His his sort of fierce intelligence, but also um, it's always seeking out how to make the plays. Uh, as watchable and um, engaging as as possible, because the text allows for that, and the text wants to be um, funny and, and strange and moving. Because it's a contemporary take on Hamlet. So explain to our audience, that's what I love about this, because there's other directors who are doing this now, and that's what's bringing a much younger audience to the theater now, because I've had friends already see the first set of previews that you've done, and what amazed them the most were the young people who were coming to the audience. That must make you feel really great. That is wonderful, yeah. And uh, the, the the play has that at its heart, I think, this um, jagged relationship between one generation and the next, the younger generation and an older, the parent generation of these young people, um, and the messiness of that. Um, yeah, so I suppose, although it's not spelt out, but there is a feeling that this is a contemporary Danish royal family because Hamlet <laughs> takes place in Denmark, famously. Um, and so that includes everything um, between uh, a system of surveillance, but also um, a, a want on our part to that these people feel recognizable as human beings that we know today um in positions of power and 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 um and authority and also it feels like a family it feels like a um a recognizable messy um contemporary family struggling and failing to um live around and with one another yeah you're working with an incredible group of actors. Mm -hmm. What is it like sharing the stage with them here at the Armory? It's wonderful. Our cast is wonderful. <laughs> I love them. And, um, uh, you know, very, you know, it's so hard working. I mean, I'm lucky because I'm not in the Oresteia, so I don't have to worry about uh, doing two. Doing two. Um, but almost all the rest of the cast are in rep, so they're having to navigate these two big um plays um and they do it with such wit and um uh humor and um energy um yeah we got off the plane from the uk having rehearsed for a month and a bit and then straight into tech and straight into previews and y it, it's um we had a, uh one of our first days off yesterday <laughs> and um <laughs> And we've been rehearsing in the daytime and filming in the evening, so it's sort of a real, yeah, uh, it's it, it's it's not easy in any circumstance bringing 15, I think that's 15 of us in the cast together at one point, and um, everybody is still um, uh, giving every ounce of themselves, which is, um, yeah, a beautiful thing. And playing here at the Armory, th what I love about the Armory is, you know, they've turned it into a theater. They've done a lot of incredible theater pieces here, including the Lehman Trilogy and many things before then. What it's been like for you, like, you know, playing in this beautiful building? 
it's quite extraordinary. It feels like something. It feels like uh, like a, like a, a castle. <laughs> well, yeah, it does. It feels like a very perfect home for a piece about um, the royal Danish family in its history. Yeah. I was saying the other day with someone, somebody else, about how it's also that there's 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 a, a, a beautiful um, sense of the past here, but the space is changing all the time. So we've built a theatre with it inside the drill hall, yeah. um, but when we leave, there'll be another thing, and maybe not a play, but an art installation. I don't, I'm not actually sure what's next on the program, um, but that sort of ephemeral quality here is so exciting as well, and it's in the middle of New York. Um, <laughs> yeah, this sort of castle that uh, the inside of it is always changing, um, like a Argonaut. Yeah, it's uh, quite amazing. Well, well, last time you were here in New York, you were at St. Anne's Warehouse in that beautiful production of The Jungle. What did you enjoy the most about playing St. Anne's and playing The Jungle? St. Anne's similarly has sort of um, the building itself is beautiful and um, and quite weighty um but the inside is always changing and, and it's a movable space um and we came from the young vic in london which is a very particular space that changes all the time as well and is built for that purpose but for theater um as st Anne's too and it was sort of a perfect home um for that play um sort of the bigger sort of more um commercial west end theaters um because of the particular design of that play, um, St. Anne's was wonderful. And to be, it was a very different, I mean, here we are in the middle of summer. I've never been in New York at this time of year. Then we were in the middle of winter, and so it felt like a totally different city. Yeah. You've had both of our seasons then. You've had summer here, and you've had winter when you were here the last time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, it's qu I don't really know how uh, this city survives with the sort of extremes. I remember going out for a jog in during the run of uh, the jungle at St. Anne's and sort of my eyes filling up with water because it's so cold and then the, they, they f the tears froze. Froze. Face. <laughs> and here uh, I you know, get the subway home and I'm, um, you know, sticking with sweat by the time I get to my front door. So, yeah, it's quite a, um, yeah, a, a, a city of extremes, isn't it? Are you enjoying this time here? Because like you said, the last time you were here was before the pandemic and now you're back seeing New York through a whole different set of eyes. Yeah, although... I haven't, you know, we've been so <laughs> busy, so busy that I'm, I am looking forward to once we get into the run and sort of, we've sort of carved out our um, space a little bit with the play, having time to um, get to know the city at this time of year a bit better. Yeah. And see, you know, um, the occasional nights when I have time off to see other shows and yeah. Are you going to have a blast here? I know you're here through August 13th. Was it a hard text to learn? And do you remember that first performance here, your first preview performance here? What do you remember about that night and that performance? So two questions. The, 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 the text, um, because we had, we were waiting for two years to come here. Rob told me two years ago, before we knew the pandemic was, of course, going to hit, um, learn the text now. And we all had to learn the text before we arrived at rehearsals. And thank goodness we did, because... Um, it is sometimes so thorny and so particular and precise that you can't sort of be riffing, <laughs> sadly. So, um, yeah, th I mean, that was sort of pre-rehearsal starting. Um, and just the, you know, it's, it's the most boring part <laughs> of, of, of any rehearsal process, but so necessary. And then once you've done it, you're free. And then th your second question about first preview, I had in my head in the first preview something that, Mark Rylance apparently said, I'm not sure, wonderful Rylance, um, that what's amazing at the end of the play is that you sort of feel like you've lived a whole life in the space of four hours and you're lying there dead on the stage and you feel as though, yeah, you've, you've had your heart broken, you've killed someone, you've, um, uh, you've lost your friends, you've sort of g gained some sort of knowledge of what it is to be alive, all in the space of um, these short four hours and you're lying there in Horatio's arms. It's quite an am amazing feeling, but apart from that, I don't really remember any of the first preview. <laughs> you took your bow and that was it. Yeah. 
if I I think I probably I also forgot to sort of bow because Rob wanted me to come on and bow by myself. I've never done that before, so I just forgot and just called everyone else on immediately because I was just sort of on another planet. Everybody who I've spoken to about their first performance in a big Shakespearean play, they say, I remember walking on the stage and sort of taking my bow, and everything else is a blur of that first performance on. Yeah, I remember my first job I did, there was an actor and a chancellor who said um, that apparently there's the same amount of adrenaline, you, I don't know if it's true, it's a nice sort of theatre thing, but there's the same amount of adrenaline in your blood um, when you do a first night as there is if you've been in a car accident. So this. <laughs> The sort of the, the brain just um, just becomes uh, just an, uh, amnesia takes over. I think. You made your professional acting debut playing the role of John in Sir David Hare's South Downs. How magical was that debut? Uh, it w it yeah for me it, I did find it quite magical looking back because I had no I I, I didn't realize um, I had no idea how to become an actor start working as an actor and um, it was an open audition um, and it was uh, a really a really beautiful story about a young man at school um, not understanding why things had to be th a certain way and him trying to push against that and as a, I think I was 16, 17 when I auditioned and did rehearsals I had no idea of my good fortune it sort of felt like I was doing a you know like a summer camp or something <laughs> it didn't it, I, d I sort of naively was um not um not focused on what it meant or or, or, or the weight of it um and thank goodness because it meant that I, I loved it and um yeah th I think really fondly of all of the actors in that play and uh and then we moved so it was a regional theatre and then it moved up to West End and thanks to that I started working as an actor really so yeah that is crazy an open call yeah. for a David Hare play <laughs> but you know a lot of people I've spoken to said if I had known the weight of it going into the they say it, they never would have done it it's like someone who first auditioned for Stephen Sondheim right out of school and they were like if I had actually known what I was doing that I was standing in front of him I never would have done it yes oh yeah I can imagine I mean that would be <laughs> um, Sir David Hare. Okay, Maggie Smith, you have a huge fan in Dame Maggie Smith, right? She gave you an incredible compliment after that show. Well, I I don't know if I don't really know what she said now because it was you know ten years ago. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've well, I'm going to repeat it for people who don't know. This is like Dame Maggie Smith is my all-time favorite person, oh, and yeah. she said that most actors meaning herself included, spend their whole lifetime trying to do what you did in your debut. Yes, which seems an extraordinary <laughs> thing to say to a 17-year-old, but it's so encouraging. I mean, also you could sort of just hang up your hat there, couldn't you? And um, yeah. Have you ever met her? Uh, yes. And goddess, royalty of all of them. But when I read that quote, I was like, wow, do you know, it's, but they all, everyone starts out somewhere. Yeah. But for her to say that about you must have made you feel like, a million bucks. Yeah, maybe, may, maybe she's had a gin and tonic too many in the interval or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, d d d deeply generous, uh, and and I think that, I think that is, that generosity, particularly in the theatre community, is a true thing of older actors being very generous with younger actors. And um, as a old actor myself, now I, I I I you know I can really understand that wanting to encourage and um uh and and uh yeah um and celebrate um the the actors um coming that's up. what the theater does that's what the, that's what i love about the theater people nurture each other and look out for each other yeah. which i think is great yeah. you know you made your feature film debut in the imitation game yeah i mean that was your first film what was it like working on that film and working with those people Again, I, I didn't really work with any of them because <laughs> I played the younger version of um, Cumberbatch. Um, so I met him in rehearsals and then my part of the film was shot separately. So it just sort of felt like we were making a short film somewhere in, on the south coast of England. Um, so again, there wasn't the anticipated pressure there, which, thank goodness, I mean... Um, 
Yeah, I was very fortunate for that reason, yeah. I know we, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to do a quick speed round with you because I know you have a four-hour show to do or whatever tonight, right? So um, you, gain, you gain great recognition here in America when you play James in The End of the Effing World. What did you enjoy the most about playing James in that series? Oh, acting with Jess Barden. Yeah. yeah. It really doesn't get any better than that, does it? No, she's wonderful. I miss her. She lives in California now. Yeah. And then you worked for uh, Trudy Styler, who, of course, is married to Sting, brilliant producer-director in Freak Show. What's it like working with Trudy? Trudy is um, one of the sweetest people and lives in New York, and I hope to see her um, whilst I'm over here, and that's where we shot Big Show, actually. Um, and she's an actor as well as a director and a producer, and I found that since really inspiring that there's someone who's um, uh, just using all of their imagination to do, to do many things and to do them very well. Um, yeah. And then a film that I love is Departure, which you starred opposite Juliet Stevenson. Yeah. What was it like sharing the screen with her? Oh, uh, Juliet is um, still a dear friend. She sent me a very lovely voice note the other day. Um, and, and someone I admire and continue to be amazed by. She's working with Rob on another show called The Doctor, uh, which is going to be in London, uh, was in London, and is coming back to the West End later this year. Um, and that film was quite special for me. That was my first sort of leading role in a feature film directed by the lovely Andrew Stegall, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, so yeah, th all those jobs actually you've mentioned have been um, jobs that, uh, and it's not true for all jobs, but have I've come away with really dear friends. So yeah, yeah special in that way. You have such an incredible body of work on stage, screen, and television. How do you choose a project? Uh, it's a bit of... Both is sort of you hope for good writing, um, and also you hope that um, people want to work with you. So you sort of there's a lot of crossing your fingers that um, uh, some good writing comes up, um, and also then hoping that uh, you fit that puzzle piece that you're that you're the piece that fits that puzzle. Um, but yeah, I suppose. Uh, it's it's a good good story that um, counts. Because I was watching your body of work and I said, boy, you do so many wonderful different things. You've done it all at such a young age too, which I think is great. <laughs> My final question for you that I want to ask you is, because of your success on film and television, you'll be introducing a young audience to the theater like it's already coming to Hamlet. We all had that experience by going to see somebody we knew from another media. And you're going to show them this wonderful world of live theater. Mm. What that means to you as an actor and as a, just as a person? Yeah, I love I love the theater, and um, and I think there are uh, rush tickets here because I know that New York ticket prices are expensive, um, as they are in London, um, which is uh, which is a shame um, and because it's it's limiting. Um, but the experience of being in a room with the people and uh, yeah, being being part of a story being told, uh, I I I love being in an audience. Um, so I hope that um, people enjoy being an audience to our show. We'll have the best time during your run. I'll be catching it next week and just enjoy yourself. Thank you. A real pleasure to meet you, my friend. Bye. Thank you, Alex.